Uh, today we step back into Amos, and last time we walked through the introduction to the book, and also through the first of God's declarations of judgment against these nations, namely that being Syria. And that's kind of where we focused our time. We paused there. Uh, we'd spent a good amount of time in the introduction, so we weren't going to get through all of those nations anyway. But it was a good nation to pause on because uh, as we connected the history of what was being, or the judgment here, to what, was, what, what had been done in history, we uh, connected the history of Hazael specifically, the king of Syria, and thus able to learn a lesson specifically from his interaction with the prophet Elisha. And today we continue in God's declarations of judgment, picking up in verse 6. And we're going to walk through all of the other nations, uh, stopping short of talking about Israel. Next week we'll get into Israel itself, and we've got quite a bit to say about the verses that, that speak toward their sin. But this week it's going to be a little bit more academic as we walk through sin after sin, and we'll connect these things to various points in history or in doctrine that we see throughout the history of the Scriptures and try to gain an understanding of just what it is that God is saying to each of these nations. So there in Amos chapter 6, or excuse me, chapter 1, verses 6 through 8, the Bible says this, Thus saith the Lord, for three transgressions of Gaza, and for four I will not turn away the punishment thereof, because they carried away captive the whole captivity to deliver them up to Edom. But I will send a fire on the wall of Gaza, which shall devour the palaces thereof. And I will cut off the inhabitant from Ashdod, and him that holdeth the scepter from Ashkelon. And I will turn mine hand against Ekron, and the remnant of the Philistines shall perish, saith the Lord God. God's declarations of judgment goes from Syria and now falls upon the Philistines. And as with Syria and with uh, most of these nations, God represents them through their chief cities. In this case, the cities are Gaza, Ashkelon, and Ekron. Did I miss one there? And Ashdod, excuse me. Gaza, Ashdod, Ashkelon, and Ekron. And we see a very similar for, uh, formula here that we saw introduced last week with Syria. First, this numerical statement of offenses for three offenses and for four. And we talked through that a little bit, what that may or may not mean, whether there were actually seven offenses, uh, whether there were four offenses in some places, the six plus one formula type idea. In this, it does seem as though, or I believe that there's a, a three plus four formula here, leading to a seven, but not a literal seven offenses, but rather in the biblical idea of seven, the, the, the number of perfection, the number of completion, that their judgment has now come to full, full fruition, and that the judgment that God states within the text here is the judgment that tipped over that tipped, tipped God's wrath over into judgment, that it filled up the cup, and this was the last drop that fell into the cup that caused the water to pour over the cup. And so we see that idea for three transgressions and for four. And then second, we see the offense itself. And in this case, the Bible says that the people of Gaza carried away captive the whole captivity to deliver them up. To Edom. Now, we'll find the same offense levied against the next nation, the nation of uh, the Phoenicians, as represented by Tyrus, which we'll talk about in just a few minutes. The historical reference of which we speak here is a little less clear than that of Syria. We do not find an account necessarily of God stirring up the Philistines uh, against Israel in the same way that, that we did in the nation of Syria, but... but um, or excuse me, do, we do find a count, but it's not about Israel, it's about Judah. So God did stir up the Philistines to come against God's people, but the account that we have is not of Israel, it is of Judah. And we find that account in 2 Chronicles 21, about God's dealings with that southern kingdom in the days of Jehoshaphat's son, Jehoram. Now, if you recall from your understanding of the kings in the Chronicles, Jehoram was kind of an interesting time in Israel's history, in Judah, excuse me, in their history. This would have been the time when there were the closest possible ties since the divided kingdom between the northern tribes of Israel and the southern tribes of Judah. And that's because Jehoshaphat had married his son to Ahab's daughter, Athaliah. And so, and we believe, as we talk, we've talked through in Sunday school quite a bit, 
we would believe that Jehoshaphat was probably trying to create a, a, a strength and ties between these two nations. And I believe personally that Jehoshaphat's eventual goal was that he was attempting to reunite the kingdom under one banner. That ended up not happening as we know from history. However, I believe that's what he was trying to do. So as a part of that, he took his, his son Jehoram and he actually uh, um, brought Athaliah, Ahab's daughter in, and, they mar and she married Jehoram. And in doing so, uh, it brought about a time of great wickedness, probably the most wicked time, at least until near the end, in Judah's history. So to this end, because there was such a close connection between Israel and Judah in that time, it is possible that when the Lord stirred up the Philistines in the days of Jehoram to come against Judah, that there may have been a connection there by which Israel as well uh, was influenced, and it may be that that we're speaking of here. Within this time, the Edomites had just revolted in their dominion against Judah. And because of his wickedness, verse 16 tells us in 2 Chronicles chapter 21, Moreover, the Lord stirred up against Jehoram the spirit of the Philistines and of the Arabians that were near the Ethiopians. And they came up into Judah and break into it and carried away all the substance that was found in the king's house and his sons also, and his wives, so that there was never a son left him, save Jehoahaz, the youngest of his sons. Now, what we don't have in this account is any record of the Philistines necessarily delivering this captivity to Edom, nor do we have any direct evidence that the Philistines' campaign extended again beyond Judah into Israel itself. So it is entirely possible that the account of which God is judging the nation for, the account that pushed them into the place of, of judgment was not necessarily this account directly. But this is the closest I could find historically to the events at hand, and it's also possible that this was the idea. Moving past this transgression, then, we come to God's promise of judgment. And it's very similar to what we studied last week regarding Syria. As a matter of fact, the majority of the judgments are very, very similar. Some different wording, different cities, of course, that God is speaking to, but very, very similar ideas with all of this judgment. He tells them that he would send a fire on the wall of Gaza. The city thus would be burned to the ground. That was the idea, right? Sending a fire upon the wall. The walls are burnt to the ground. The city is burnt to the ground. And then he says he would cut off the inhabitant of Ashdod. Within an invasion setting, as the cities are burned to the ground, their people are destroyed, and that's the idea. And him that holdeth the scepter in Ashkelon. Not only would the common man be affected by this, it would not just be that the nation would be decimated in its, in its regular population, as we see so many times both in biblical history and in, um, in secular history. But we also uh, find here that the kings, right, that those who hold the scepter, that the elites, that the powerful in society would also be destroyed. And then he, God says he would turn his hand against Ekron, being that final great city of Philistia. So we have these four great cities of the Philistines and God labels each one of them as having met, uh, as going to meet their doom. And the idea of all four of those cities meeting their doom is an idea that says that the entire nation will be consumed. If every great city is consumed, then the nation is no more. The nation is consumed. And Bible uh, history tells us that this did in fact happen. Although, if, uh, if, if you're, you're wondering, you say, well, pastor, I recall from all of my Bible lessons in Sunday schools that there were five great cities in Philistia. There were not four, there were five. What about that last city? So we have Gaza, Ashdod, Ashkelon, and Ekron mentioned here in Amos, but the city of Gath is not mentioned. Why isn't the city of Gath mentioned? And it was not an oversight in our Bibles. It was not a historical um, error in our Bibles. In 1 Chronicles chapter 18, the Bible says that David conquered Gath and he assimilated Gath into Judah. And so Gath was no longer a great city of Philistia by this time. So there were only four great cities and all four of them are mentioned. And this also reminds us once again of the historical accuracy and the relevance of the word of God to our lives. One final thought then before moving on. The transgression here is that Upon this conquering, it would appear that the Philistines took many of 
the, those of the nation of Israel captive, but they did not keep them for themselves, as we studied in Sunday school this morning, where Naaman the Syrian, when he went into Israel and he uh, um, uh, took... Uh, took, took the lands of Israel. He took captive some of Israel. And of course, this young, this little maid um, was his wife's maiden uh, in the days where Naaman was struggling with his leprosy. But in this account, God says that what the Philistines did is they took these Israeli people captive and then they sold them or they gave them over to the nation of Edom. Knowing the problems between both Israel, Judah, and the Edomites over the years, we might imagine the implication of this. Why would it be that this would be such a, a, a horrific thing? It is not the, the thing that, that makes God angry is not intrinsically that the Philistines cap, took these, these people captive, but that having taken them captive, they then delivered them unto Edom. And why is it such a big deal? that they delivered them unto Edom. What we might imagine the implication here is that in giving the nation, these, these conquered peoples of Israel over to Edom, it was an opportunity for the Edomites to have some measure of revenge. The history between the Israelites and the Edomites is storied. As a matter of fact, it goes all the way back, if you recall, to the days of Jacob and Esau, and not just as brothers in their older years, but all the way back to the womb. They contended in their mother's womb, so much so that Rebecca inquired of the Lord as to what was happening in there. And the Lord tells her that there were two nations in her womb and that those nations were already battling. That's Genesis 25, 23. And that the elder Esau, who would become the name Esau, uh, he, his name would, would be changed or he would be called Edom, that word meaning red because he was red and hairy all over. Esau would become the nation of Edom. And of course, the younger, when God prophesied that the elder would serve the younger, the younger was Jacob, whose name would also be changed. Esau's name was changed to Edom. Jacob's name was changed to Israel. And so this is a very long and storied history between these two nations. But in that it was not uncommon for them to be enslaving one another, for the Philistines, and as we'll see in a moment, Tyrus also, to hand the people of Israel over to be enslaved by the Edomites would basically be handing them over to their worst enemies handing them over to people that had a significantly greater animosity against Israel than necessarily the Philistines or Tyrus had. He, the, the Edomites would not think twice about abusing or misusing the people of Israel. And to that extent, we might imagine that that is why God saw this as so egregious, is because they were handing them over to a kind of misuse, abuse, torture, enslavement, that would have been significantly harder on them than handing them over to any other nation that was round about them. And that brings us then to Tyrus. We read in Amos chapter 1, verses 9 and 10, Thus saith the Lord, For three transgressions of Tyrus, and for four I will not turn away the punishment thereof, because they delivered up the whole captivity to Edom, and remembered not the brotherly covenant. But I will send a fire on the wall of Tyrus, which shall devour the palaces thereof. We come next to the city of Tyrus. This was the primary city of the Phoenician people. Tyrus had both a strong parallel as well, as well as a strong distinction from the others that we've seen thus far. First, we see, of course, these parallels. Once again, the formula is three transgressions and four. Once again, the transgression is in fact the same as it was for Philistia. They delivered up the people of Israel after conquering them, taking them captive to the Edomites, thus adding insult to injury and compounding the wrong through the torturous captivity that we might presume that would happen at the hands of their great enemies. And again, there is some inference there on my part. So do take note of that. But notice this interesting last little bit. Well, before we get to that, notice the judgment. He says there, but I will send a fire on the walls of Tyrus, which shall devour the palaces thereof. 
So the judgment is the same as the others so far, that God would send a fire, that the city of Tyrus would be burned to the ground, and the siege of the city would utterly destroy it, including the palaces, right, which means not just the common people, but also the leaders of the nation also. Now let's talk about a notice, notable difference here. In God's listing of the offense, God did not just cite the fact that Tyrus sold these people, the Israelis, to the Edomites. But he says that in doing so, the city of Tyrus remembered not the brotherly covenant. The covenant that's spoken of here is a covenant that was made between King Solomon and the king of Tyrus, a man named Hiram. And we see the beginning of this relationship actually with Hiram and David. David is the reason that Hiram got into this covenant with Solomon because Hiram loved David. We see that in 2 Samuel chapter 5. But the depths of this is realized in 1 Kings 5. So in 2 Samuel 5, we see the initiation of relationship between David and Hiram, and they have a wonderful relationship, and throughout their days, there's a very good back and forth between them, both economically and, um, and, and, and physically as, as a relationship between them. But the depth of this, as I said, is realized in 1 Kings 5 in the days of Solomon, where we read this beginning in verse 1. And Hiram... The king of Tyre sent his servants unto Solomon, for he had heard that he had anointed him king in the room of his father, for Hiram was ever a lover of David. So David and Hiram, they were true friends. And Solomon establishes a good relationship as well. And if you were to continue to read, you'd find out all the ways that that relationship uh, came forth. So that then we get to verse 12 of 1 Kings 5, where the Bible says this. And the Lord gave Solomon wisdom, as he promised him, and there was peace between Hiram and Solomon, and they too made a league together. And here we see the direct reference to this covenant that we find in Amos chapter 1. It is called here in 2 Kings, uh, 1 Kings 5, 12, a league, but that word league there is the word berit in the Hebrew. And that word berit is found all throughout the Old Testament. And particularly, if you were to look at the Genesis references, you would find that all of those times where the Bible says that God made a covenant with man, the covenant that he made at the rainbow, the covenant that he made with Abraham, it's the same word, berit. So this is the idea of a covenant, a compact, a league, one with another, a teaming up or a confederacy. In other words, Hiram and Solomon came into this covenant. And this covenant between them was of such that they were not to attack one another. So we find a true record of this covenant between Hiram and Solomon during the United Kingdom. And then when that kingdom broke up between north and south, perhaps it was that Tyrus said, well, I mean, we made this covenant with Jerusalem and now the capital of the northern kingdom is not Jerusalem, it's Samaria. So that's a different nation and we can go after this nation. But God didn't see it that way. God saw this still as his people. God saw that covenant as a covenant between Hiram, Tyrus, and his people. And obviously God did not take lightly the breach of this covenant. To this end, we actually find no record in the scriptures of any king, either of Israel or of Judah, ever making war upon Tyre. Naturally, however, the same cannot be said for Tyre against Israel, where the Bible says they took captive those of Israel, breaking this covenant between Hiram and Solomon and adding insult to injury again by selling or giving, yielding those captives to the Edomites. And so that's the story of Tyre. And this leads us to the next nation, the nation of Edom. So we've talked about Philistia and Tyre, Phoenicia, both of which gave their captives over to Edom. Now we talk about Edom herself. And the first of, uh, this is the first of Israel's distant relatives to face the judgment of God. We're going to find a couple more relatives of Israel in the verses that are to come, but this is the first and perhaps the most consequential in Amos chapter 11 and 12, where the Bible says, Thus saith the Lord, For three transgressions of Edom and for four I will not turn away the punishment thereof, because he did pursue his brother with the sword and did cast off all pity, and his anger did tear perpetually and he kept his wrath forever. 
kept, yes, his wrath forever. But I will send a fire upon Teman, which shall devour the palaces of Basra. So the formulation of three and four transgressions continues. Edom follows naturally after the promise of judgment, both for Philistia and Tyre. Those two nations delivered up the captivity to Edom. And now God focuses upon the nation of Edom herself, and we find what they did to Israel. Presumably what they did to these captives that they either purchased or received from Philistia and from Tyre. God says they pursued their brother with the sword, acknowledging again the family ties, right? This was your brother. This is Jacob and Esau. You pursued your brother with the sword. But notice the nature of this pursuit. Verse 11 says, they cast off all pity and in anger they tore perpetually and they kept his wrath forever. And it was this kind of abuse, this kind of violence against God's people that has tipped the cup of God's wrath over as it relates to Edom. This is why God was so, excuse me, angry with Philistia and with Phoenicia. Because when they gave the people of Israel over to Edom, Edom did this thing. They tore perpetually. They kept their wrath against Israel forever. And they, from generation to generation to generation, anytime they could, they would violently release this wrath against the people, God's people. And this stands in dramatic contrast to the manner in which God commanded Israel to treat Edom. Now, it's not to say that Israel always treated Edom well over the years. But God had commanded a great deal of respect to be given to Edom by Israel. In Numbers chapter 20, the nation was passing through the land of Edom on their way to the promised land. And the Bible says that Moses sent messengers to Edom's king requesting that they could have safe passage through the land on the basis of their familial ties. Moses told them, we will touch nothing. We will pay for everything that we use. We will stay on the road. We will not deviate from that road. We will not uh, uh, get off, of, off the track at all. We will stay where we ought to stay. We just want to go through your land. We're not interested in conquering you. We're not interested in fighting you. We, we just want to pass through your land. And the Bible says that Edom refused this passage. However, even in this, the Bible tells us that Israel did not then step in and say, well, fine, then we're going to conquer you. Much to the contrary, Numbers chapter 20, verse 14 tells us that Israel actually turned around. They turned their millions of people around and they went around Edom. They went another way because God did not want Israel touching Edom. Furthermore, in Moses' great exhortation to the people before his death, we read these words in Deuteronomy 23, verse 7. Thou shalt not abhor the Edomite, for he is thy brother. Thou shalt not abhor an Egyptian, because thou wast a stranger in his land. That makes this the only nation on the list, aside from the nation of Judah itself, which God explicitly prohibited Israel from abhorring. Edom was supposed to have a special place in the minds of God's people. They were supposed to be a cared for people, a regarded people. Now the history of the nation shows Israel did not always do well at obeying this command. Much to the contrary, many a king attacked the Edomites in his day. Yet by the command of the Lord, the nation of Edom was a favored nation in God's eyes because that nation too came from the loins of Abraham and Isaac. And this made the actions of Edom against Israel all the more egregious. And for this we see Edom would suffer the same fate as the others. That a fire would fall upon the city of Teman and that the cities of Basra would be devoured. The palaces of Basra, speaking again of the leaders of the land, not just of the common people, 
that would be destroyed. Now, we continue, and the next two nations that we're going to look at are often put together in Scripture, and that for good reason. So I'm going to put them together as well. I'm going to read the next two nations together. The Bible says in Amos chapter 1, beginning in verse 13, or continuing in verse 13, Thus saith the Lord, For three transgressions of the children of Ammon, and for four, I will not turn away the punishment thereof, because they have ripped up the women with the child of Gilead, that they might enlarge their border. But I will kindle a fire in the wall of Rabbah, and it shall devour the palaces thereof with shouting in the day of battle, with a tempest in the day of the whirlwind, and their king shall go into captivity, he and his princes together, saith the Lord. Thus saith the Lord, for three transgressions of Moab and for four, I will not turn away the punishment thereof, because he burned the bones of the king of Edom into lime. But I will send a fire upon Moab, and it shall devour the palaces of Kerioth, and Moab shall die with tumult with shouting and with the sound of the trumpet. And I will cut off the judge from the midst thereof and will slay all the princes thereof with him, saith the Lord. So the two nations mentioned next are Ammon and Moab. These two nations are often regarded together because they often acted together. They were separate nations, but they were very, very close nations one to another. And that's perhaps not surprising because if we go back to their lineage, their lineage is very, very close as well. They both go back to Abraham's nephew, Lot, if you recall. In Genesis chapter 19, remember God destroys Sodom and Gomorrah. He does that because of the wickedness of the city. We'll actually talk more about that next week. Lot, the Bible says, fled with his wife and two of his daughters. His wife turns around. She was told not to do that. And when she turned around to look at the city being destroyed, she was turned into a pillar of salt. And so there's no more Lot's wife. Remember Lot's wife, as the scriptures call us to do. And Lot and his two daughters flee to the city of Zoar. They were told to flee to the mountains. They said, oh, please not the mountains. Uh, Lot appealed to flee to the city of Zoar. God said, that's fine. Zoar is not going to be destroyed. He goes to Zoar. It becomes very apparent very quickly that he's not comfortable there and he ends up in the mountains anyway. And the Bible tells us there he was in the mountains and he was alone living in a cave with his two daughters. And the scriptures tell us that his two daughters did not want to leave their, their father with no posterity, with no sons to carry on their names. So they inebriate their father and they lie with him after, e after which each of these daughters becomes pregnant with one of his children. The eldest daughter bore a son, and that son's name would be called Moab. And the youngest daughter also bore a son, and that son's name would be called Ammon. So like Edom, Deuteronomy chapter 2 verse 19 tells us that the children of Ammon and the, uh, that, that the children of Ammon specifically were protected by God in the days of the Exodus, but they would fight against Israel nevertheless. Moab, however, never gave God a chance to protect them. Ammon was protected by God. God said, don't go after Ammon. He's your brother. Ammon came out against them, and, and that, that, that sealed their fate. But Moab never even got that chance. For it was the king of Moab who in those days sought unto that great false prophet, the man named Balaam in Numbers 22. And he sought to Balaam that Balaam would curse the people for him. And when that did not work, on the advice of Balaam, the king of Moab sent his women, the women of the nation, into Israel to commit whoredom with them that they might be cursed. This, this was called the great sin of Peor. And they were cursed by God. And for this, God turned his wrath against Moab and told the nation of Israel to slay Moab. To this end, God then thus would curse both Ammon and Moab, and we read in Deuteronomy chapter 23, verses 3 and 4, an Ammonite or a Moabite shall not enter into the congregation of the Lord. Even to their tenth generation shall they not enter into the congregation of the Lord forever, because they met you not with bread and with water in the way when ye came forth out of Egypt, and because they hired against thee Balaam, the son of Baor of Pethor of Mesopotamia, to curse thee. 
The hostility of these nations put them into a place of cursing, whereas God had been otherwise inclined unto blessing them. And this curse was now coming to full fruition by prophecy at least here in the book of Amos. Now regarding Ammon, God says that his judgment rests upon them because they ripped up pregnant women in Gilead for the sake of enlarging their borders. This is likely the same instance that we studied last week regarding Syria. To this end, most likely Ammon leagued with Syria, came from the other direction, Syria from the north, Ammon from the south, in order to press Israel as a part of this plan of conquering. But they did not just conquer, they massacred the women and the children all that they might enlarge their borders, and for this God's wrath rested upon them. He says that the city of Rabbah, their capital, would fall, and the kings and the princes would go into captivity for their sin. Then we step into chapter 2 for Moab, where God tells them that he would judge them, and this is interesting, for burning the bones of the king of Edom. In this... We find the first and only city, the first and only nation, which God cites the transgression for their judgment, the final transgression, not being a transgression against Israel, but rather a transgression against Edom. Now, we know that Edom had a favored place in God's eyes as well. I already taught you that. So this is not necessarily surprising, but it is interesting. Is it not that this time God says, it is for something that you did to Edom that I have now declared judgment against you. Now we've already mentioned that Edom had an elevated place in God's heart because they were of Esau, the son of Isaac. But this is interesting. The particular transgression was burning the bones of the king of Edom. Now, we don't exactly know what this reference is, but, but history, though, though, though history doesn't record a direct account, tradition does. And tradition tells us that the account of this actually stems from the events of 2 Kings chapter 3. Again, my Sunday school crew uh, will be familiar with the events of 2 Kings 3. In that chapter, Ahab's son, Jehoram, this is not Jehoshaphat's son, Jehoram, but Ahab's son Jehoram, there was Jehoram on each end and they both became king around the same time. But Ahab's son Jehoram of Israel and Jehoshaphat, who was still the king of Judah, leagued with the king of Edom. The Edom was a, a vassal king at the time and all three of these kings came together and they formed a confederacy. And they formed a confederacy against a rebellion of Moab where Moab was rebelling against Israel in that day. And the Bible tells us that because of the Lord's intercession and the Lord interceded specifically on behalf of Jehoshaphat because Jehoshaphat was, was beloved of the Lord. And so the Lord says, because Jehoshaphat is here, I'm going to rescue you guys out of this problem that you're in because they found themselves in a problem. They had no water for the horses and whatnot. And so they were given water. And at the same time, the Moabites looked across the field and they saw all this water and, they, and it looked because of the time of day as blood. And they said, aha, the Confederacy of Kings has, they have turned against one another and they have all killed themselves, let us now go into their camps and take the spoil. And they go there and it just so happens that all these kings are still alive and all their armies are still alive and those armies absolutely destroy the Moabites. And so things are going very, very bad for the Moabites. And as they are lo losing this battle, the king of Moab makes a final attempt to break the lines and he chooses the king of Edom to break those lines. So you had uh, Judah and you had Israel and you had Edom and they had each taken a portion of the battlefield. And so the king of Moab directed his troops toward the king of Edom and sought to break the lines through Edom, perhaps assuming that Edom was the uh, least invested and the most, uh, the, the, the weakest and so the easiest to break those lines. And they attempt to break those lines and the Bible says that they could not break the lines of Edom. So Edom withstood that charge and at that point the king of Moab uh, had, had, had no other uh, um, uh, tools in his arsenal at that point. And the Bible says that he took his eldest son, the one who was supposed to be the next king in Moab, and he burnt his son upon the wall. 
Now, we don't know all of exactly what that means, whether it was a religious ritual, whether it was some sort of um, uh, appeal to the gods, or whether it was some statement of indignation. But the Bible does tell us this in 2 Kings chapter 3, verse 27, that because of that event, after that event, after he burnt his son on the wall, everyone just kind of went away. They dispersed. And that because of this event, the Bible says there was great indignation against Israel presumably on the case of Moab, that something that happened there that caused this king to burn his son on the wall, the son that was supposed to be his heir, brought a tremendous amount of indignation against Israel by Moab. But not just against Israel. Tradition states that this was also against Edom. So that in the days when Moab retained, regained power and they took over the land of Edom, they actually dug up the bones of the king whose lines did not break in that battle and they burned them. Thus desecrating the bones of that king, thus desecrating the name of, uh, 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 of, of the people of the land, of the nation, and disrespecting them utterly. Now, I said, we learn nothing of Moab and Edom after this event in the Bible, after the event of Moab burning his son, the king of Moab burning his son on the wall. But according to Jerome, Jewish tradition states that this was the event that caused the, the Moabites to, to uh, um, dig up the bones of the, of the Edomite king and, and to burn them. Whether that was the offense or not, we find God's promise is the same to Moab that it was to all of the other nations. Judgment by war, judgment by fire, the great men and the princes being destroyed along with the, along with the, the, the commoners. One more nation to consider this evening before we think through a possible application. And as we come to this final nation, before God turns his eyes toward Israel, that nation is in fact the southern kingdom of Judah where we read this, verses two or 4 and 5 of Amos chapter 2. Thus saith the Lord, For three transgressions of Judah, and for four, I will not turn away the punishment thereof, because they have despised the law of the Lord and have not kept his commandments, and their lies caused them to err, after the which their fathers have walked. But I will send a fire upon Judah, and it shall devour the palaces of Jerusalem." Now, the transgressions of Judah follow the same formula, three transgressions and four, whereas the offenses of the other nations had to do with their dealings with Israel, with the notable exception of Moab, who's dealt with Edom. Judah's offenses are all about the way that they treated God. Their offenses against God's law because they had broken God's covenant, because they had defied God's commands, because lies had caused the people to err from the way that God had designated them to go. The leaders had lied to the nation, had lied to them spiritually, and thus had brought them into sin. And for this, the same promise was made to them that was made to all of the other nations, that the palaces of Jerusalem would be devoured with fire, thus being not just the common people, but also the leaders of the nation. And thus the nation itself would be destroyed. Now next week we'll step into the content of Amos' prophecies against Israel. And that's really where the book takes on its objective, where we see uh, the, the message that God has through Amos really start to come to fruition. To this point, there has been a, a feel of introduction to the things we've talked about. And we already talked a little bit in the weeks pr previous about the order that God uh, approached the book of Amos and the slight uniqueness of God's order to these prophecies. It's rather common to have God speak against the nations, but he usually speaks against the nations after he's spoken against the nation to whom the prophecies are actually directed. Here, however, we see a reversal of that, that God first spoke against the nations and then he turns his eyes to Israel. And I mentioned last week that one of the reasons why many people believe that this is is kind of a bait and a switch sort of a thing, not that God is a con man, but that uh, the idea is that God first would tell them about all of the sins of the other nations and they'd say, yeah, yeah, God, get those nations, nail them to the wall, tear them up, get them, get them, get them. <laughs> 
And then after they have said, yes, 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 these nations are wicked. Yes, 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 they've done all of these terrible things. Then God says, oh, by the way, you've done all these things too, and I'm about to judge you. And thus, in doing so, they would not be able to necessarily, logically or consistently, refute what God had said to them. You know how it is. How it is with humanity. How we kind of get this idea Right? That we look out at the people around us and we say, oh, they're such wicked people. God, I can't wait until you judge them. And as the old adage goes, when one finger's pointing out at them, three fingers are pointing back at you. And we forget that we ourselves do a lot of the same things. And we forget that we ourselves are also sinners. And we forget that we ourselves are, are, are no better in ourselves than anyone else. And anything that we have that has any virtue, that has any, anything of value is found through the grace of Jesus Christ and through the power of his spirit in us. And so there's a possibility that that's kind of what God was doing here. That he was, he was kind of leading them along, giving them enough rope to hang themselves type thing. Only to then at the end say, and by the way, this is you, right? You're this too. However, as I mentioned last week, one of the reasons why I don't find that completely compelling is because God did say in verse 2 of Amos chapter 1 that when the Lord would roar out of Zion and utter his voice out of Jerusalem, that it would bring about a wasting of Carmel and a destruction of the region. And so they have already heard, at least in part, at least a little bit, that God is angry against them as well. However, it is still very possible that there's a sort of luring the nation into listening here. And of this, we are reminded as well. And we'll talk about that in a few minutes. We'll, we'll think through that, that, that idea, apply it to our own hearts here in a, in a few minutes. But the possibility that I'd like to highlight this evening, beyond just the idea that God was pulling kind of that bait and switch, kind of that luring them in, is this. Throughout the book of Amos, we're going to consider some pretty terrible sins. And as we said in our book sermon, many of these sins will call our minds to our own day and time. We're going to cover some things. We're going to begin next week that when I'm preaching on them, your mind is going to naturally turn to our own nation, our own culture, our own leaders, churches, broadly speaking, institutions, broadly speaking. And my preaching style lends itself to an inward way of thinking, to consider our own lives, to spend far more time thinking about our needs before God than to look out at the problems of others. Because when we look out at the problems of others too much, we get judgy. Because when we look out at the problems of others too much, we lose sight of ourselves, as I already mentioned. In that, in that vernacular, if we spend too much time pointing, we forget that there are three fingers pointing back at us. And I think that it's right and it's good and it's biblical. And that's why I try to, I try to draw our minds to that, lest we be lifted up in pride lest we become self-righteous, lest we become judgmental. However, I do think here that God was also making clear, reminding his people that God's call for us to think on things which define our own walk with God does not override the fact that God also does see the sin of others. He does. God has not given us truth to find fault. God did not give us this book specifically so that we could go around finding fault in people. The, the truths of God's word are not here to find fault. The truths of God's word are here to find freedom. But we are also reminded that though the scriptures call for me to search my own heart, to see those three fingers that are pointing back at me, the scriptures also remind us, though we understand that we are to reckon with our own sins and to leave the actions of others to God, God will be their judge. 
One of the reasons why I am able as a human in my frailty and in my flesh and in the frustrations that I feel over the wickedness that is around me and the powerlessness that, that I feel when the people that are around me and the institutions that are around me are hurtling not just themselves, but, 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 but by, by extension me and my future into this place that I do not want it to be, the thing that can bring me to a place of joy and contentment whereby I can say I am going to, I am going to keep my house in order and leave the rest to God is the fact that on the day that God judges the quick and the dead, they will be judged. That's a comfort to me. And that's not an unbiblical comfort. I'm not going to do it this evening. Maybe I should. But what I'm, I'm not going to go to psalm after psalm after psalm after psalm where the thing that gets David through the day is the fact that he knows that God will be, his, will be the judge of his enemies. It's the fact that he knows that God will avenge him, that God will be his justice. But the reason why I can be confident to say, you know what, those people are doing wicked things and it's not for me to judge them. The thing that allows me to do that with anything, without being driven insane, is the fact that I know that I can leave them to God and that God can judge them far better than I ever could anyway. And believe me, God will take care of them. And for the believer, this is both a comfort and a freedom. It's a comfort because all of the wickedness of evil men today will be reckoned upon them. Know that. We look at the actions of evil men doing evil things, lying in wait to deceive, leading others in said deceptions, ruining others' lives for their own gain, destroying others in order that they might get a, a step up in this world. It's all around us, and we can see it. There's not a whole lot we can do about it. There, there, there's some things we can do. But with much of it, we feel powerless. And yet... And yet, I am comforted. And the reason why I'm comforted is because I know that not one thing that they're doing has gone unseen. And it will not go unreckoned. It's also freedom. Because what this means is that I don't need to spend my days and my hours fretting about the evil of evil men. I don't need to spend my days fretting about the success of evil men. Yes, David writes many a time, why do the wicked prosper? But in every psalm where he asks that question, why do the wicked prosper, what does he go on to do? God will judge them. God will be their judge. Their prosperity is on this earth, but this earth is but a blink in eternity. And they have a long eternity ahead of them if they do not repent. And I don't have to fret because I know God will repay. And so this unique beginning to the book of Amos can put us into a place both of tension and of judgment where we're comforted by the reality of God's judgment upon the wicked that are around about us. But then we are also reminded that when God is looking at the judgment of those that are around us, when God is looking at their sin, he is looking at ours as well. So that when we think of such things, we must do so with perspective. Perspective regarding this tension in the scriptures. And this perspective is about my own relationship with God. The Bible tells me that as it relates to eternal damnation, as it relates to an eternity in the lake of fire, which I deserve for my sin, that that wrath has been poured out on Jesus Christ. So we talked about this morning in our Resurrection Sunday message. So that every sin that I have ever committed, past, present, and future, has been laid upon Christ. He has faced that wrath for me. And yet we are also assured 
I am comforted by this reality, but I am also warned. I am also assured that there is coming a day when I, among all men, must appear before the judgment seat of Christ. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10, telling us, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body, according that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. Now for uh, we who are in Christ, what we have done in our bodies, according to 1 Corinthians chapters 1 through 3, will not redound unto our eternal damnation. It will, re it, it, it will, it will uh, effectuate in reward or loss. Will I receive rewards for the things that are done in my body or will I suffer loss? And that's another message for another day. But I am reminded, and we said this last week as well, that judgment does begin at the house of God. We talked about this tension in our Hebrew series, recognizing that the day of the judgment, day of judgment for a believer is not a day of punishment, it's reward and loss, and that not for the sins of the flesh, because Jesus paid for all of those, but for falling short of faith. Because, Hebrews eleven six 6 tells us, without faith it is impossible to please him. And Romans 14 says, whatsoever is not of faith is sin. That's Romans 14, 23. And so as we walk through Amos, we're going to be confronted with two ideas here. We're going to be confronted with this tension. The tension between the comfort that we feel when God judges the wicked. And that's, that's, that's a right comfort. The freedom that that gives me to not judge others. So that next week as I'm preaching, you're going to hear things and you're going to say, that's our society, that's our leaders, that's our institutions, and it's not going to be the only week where that's going to happen. And you're going to want to say, thank God he will judge one day and that's okay. That's okay. Now, what we don't want to say, however, is I'm so much better than them. And the reason why is because of the other side of this tension. Judgment will begin with the house of God. Judgment will begin with Legacy Baptist Church. Because all that I have is by the grace of God. And I need to remember that there's coming a day where I too will stand before the judgment seat of Christ and I will not stand there to, to give an account for my sin unto damnation. Jesus Christ already gave that account. But there will be a pile next to me of wood, hay, stubble, gold, silver, and precious stones and God will, the fire of God's judgment will fall on that pile and whatever remains will be mine as reward, and whatever burns up will be loss before the throne. So that Amos is going to call us to live within this tension. The depths of the sin which is around me, for which I am so thankful that God will judge, and a reminder that the sin in my own heart God will judge too. And by God's grace, these truths will not echo in our hearts unto us finding fault, judging self-righteousness, but rather unto pointing the way both in our lives and in our prayers for others unto freedom. And may that be our desire this evening. May our hearts burn within us to rest in the freedom that is found in obedience to God's word. The freedom found in a pure conscience toward God. May even the judgments that we discover, that we have already thought through in Amos, that we'll continue to think through in Amos, direct our hearts to recognize just how important, how imperative it is that we place our lot in the house of God. That as David wrote in Psalm 84, verses 10 and 11, for a day in thy courts is better than a thousand. I had rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than to dwell in the tents of wickedness. For the Lord God is a sun and shield. The Lord will give grace and glory. No good thing will he withhold from them that walk uprightly. Far be it from me to see in, in, in these compulsions uh, just the judgment of the wicked, but rather to see them draw me away from the tents of the wicked.
as in Korah's day when Moses said, separate yourself from that family of Korah because the God, God is about to judge them. For me to separate myself from the tents of the, of the wicked and say to God, God, even if all I can do is be a doorkeeper in your temple, I would rather be a doorkeeper in your temple than to dwell in the tents of the wicked. May our hearts be comforted that the day of wrath was already tasted for us but not so that we might hold ourselves above others, but rather that we might be compelled in a deeper way to call others to that same freedom. Not so that we might become lazy in our Christian walk because God has done the work for us, but rather so that we might know better how it is that we can please the one who died for us. And in consistency with the theme of the day, who rose again, victorious, and whoever lives to intercede. Thank you for listening to Pastor Jamin Wickler from Legacy Baptist Church in Buffalo, Minnesota. More information about Legacy Baptist Church and a library of sermons are available at www.legacybaptistchurch.net.